Hi, my name is Russ Miller with Creation, Evolution, and Science Ministries, and I thought we might look at some fun facts and compare those to the Word of God this morning. You know, the Bible tells us that all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. All Scripture. That means word for word and cover to cover. You know, the Bible tells us to prove all things and to hold fast to that which is good. You see, God's word is true, so he wants us proving things because the truth will always point right back to his word, and his word will always point to the truth. Now, what I like to call real science, operational science, is knowledge derived from the study of testable, repeatable, observable evidences. In 2 Peter 3, one of the great prophecies in the New Testament is that there shall come in the last days scoffers. Well, we certainly see our share of scoffers today, don't we? They like to say all sorts of crazy things like, I won't believe the Bible unless you can scientifically prove to me that it's true. Well, somebody said that to my wife, Joanna, a couple of weeks ago, and she was out at the resource table in the lobby and she hopped over the table, grabbed the man in a headlock and started twisting his nose back and forth and back and forth until a man's nose started to bleed profusely. So she let the man go and he said, Johanna, why did you do that to my nose? And she said, I just wanted to prove to you that the Bible is scientifically accurate because in Proverbs 30, verse 33, we're told that the ringing of the nose will bring forth blood. <laughs> and you can test, study, and observe that all day long, although I wouldn't suggest that you do so. You know, that, that great prophecy in 2 Peter continues on that those scoffers are going to claim things such as uh, the Bible's full of errors. Well, you know, a lot of folks say the Bible is full of errors. I say that there are places we don't understand what God is saying, and sometimes we just don't understand and misconstrue what we're being told. For instance, one of the areas the scoffers like to point to is in 2 Chronicles and 1 Kings, where we're told that Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots. But then in 1 Kings, we're told that Solomon had 40,000 stalls for his horses. Well, scoffers are going to say that's an error in the Bible. One says 4,000 horse and chariot stalls. The other says 40,000 horse stalls. Well, let me try to explain this. Solomon had 4,000 chariots in his army. Well, each chariot had 10 individual horses. That way, if a horse was killed or wounded in battle, they could replace the horse and not lose the entire chariot. So, he had 4,000 horse and chariot stalls, but each individual horse and chariot stall contained 10 individual horse stalls. So he had 4,000 chariot and horse stalls with a total of 40,000 individual horse stalls. No error in the Bible, just an area that we didn't quite figure out what God was telling us. Another area scoffers like to point to is 2 Chronicles 4, verse 2, where we're told that there was a brass bowl 10 cubits from brim to brim, and a line of 30 cubits compassed it round about. Well, the way you get the circumference is you take the diameter, which in this case is 10 times pi, which is 3.14. Uh, plus a few other numbers. So if you get 10 cubits times 3.14, you're looking at over 31.4 cubits roundabout. But the Bible says it was 30 cubits roundabout, and scoffers say this is an error in the Bible. However, if you read from 2 Chronicles 4, verse 5, you see that the thickness of the bowl was a hand breadth. Well, my hand breadth is about 5 inches. So both sides of the bowl were about 5 inches wide. Therefore, if you take the circumference, diameter times pi, take that 10 cubits from brim to brim, that was outside brim to outside brim. Take away five inches on each side and multiply that number times pi, and you're gonna come up with 30 cubits. No errors in the Bible. Scoffers like to say that we believe in a flat earth, that, well, if you believe in the biblical creation, you must be a flat earther. Well, actually, it was a handful of scientists that used to teach that the earth was flat. Bible-believing Christians have always known that it's a sphere, because in Isaiah, we're told that God sits upon the circle of the earth. And sure enough, about 2,000 years after the Bible told us this fact, it was discovered by mankind that the earth is spherical in shape.
Christians believe in a triune God, that God has manifested himself in three divine persons, being the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, scoffers say that we're worshiping three different gods, a Father, a Son, and a Holy Spirit. Well, in Psalms, we're told that the heavens declare the glory of God, and the heavens also manifest a triune character of space, matter, and time. Space is unseen yet omnipresent, just as God is unseen yet omnipresent. Matter is the manifestation of space, just as Jesus is the manifestation of God. And time, while not seen, provides the means through which we can experience matter, just as the Holy Spirit, while not seen, provides the means through which we can experience Jesus. Did you know that space, matter, and time as individuals each exhibit a triune character? A space is height, width, and depth. Matter comes in solid, liquid, and gas. And time consists of the past, the present, and the future. In other words, the character of the heavens do indeed declare the glory of their creator. And one Father times one Son times one Holy Spirit is one God, not three gods. The first five words of scripture are, in the beginning, God created. Albert Einstein's theory of general relativity showed that the universe is a result of something. In other words, it had to have a beginning cause. Well, logic holds that for every result that had a beginning cause, that cause must exist outside of and not be a part of the result. In other words, the cause of the universe, the beginner of the universe, had to exist outside of the universe's space, matter, and time. Of all ancient religious texts, only the biblical God claimed to exist outside of the universe's space, matter, and time. In John 17, we're told God is not of this world. He's not of the universe's space, matter, or time. And in Psalms 90, we're told, from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. God is eternal. He was the only viable cause of the universe. In fact, logic leaves atheists and Darwinists out of step with real science, but fits perfectly with our biblical creator. This Nobel Prize winning astrophysicist stated, the best data we have are exactly what I would have predicted if I had nothing to go on but the five books of Moses. There is no scientific reason not to believe God's word, word for word, and cover to cover. In Jeremiah, there's a great prophecy saying that people are going to turn their back on God, saying to a stone, thou hast brought me forth. Saying to a stone? That they came from a stone? Well, today, kids are taught in schools that earth formed four and a half billion years ago, and it started out as a hot ball of rock. And oceans formed as it rained on the rock for millions of years. A rock? You mean a stone? We, we came from a stone? You know, Darwinists, uh, naturalists, atheists, they're going to claim that if they had the raw materials to form life, that life could somehow come about on its own with all the complex genetic information and systems found in living creatures. Well, even scientists in labs can't get life to start from non-life. So let's do something simple as an experiment. Let's just start out with some simple brick and mortar and let's see if we can come up with a fabulous design through random processes. Well, the naturalists and the Darwinists, etc., say that if they had the raw materials and enough time and a source of energy, great designs would come about on their own. So let's say we take this pile of brick and mortar, and for energy, we haul it up to the top of a five-story building, and we push it off. And time-wise, we do this once per second for a billion years. How many awesome structures would we design by doing this? Absolutely none, right? We're going to get this every single time by a random chance. However, if you took that same pile of brick and mortar and you applied some simple human intelligence, well, you're going to come up with a great design every single time. You see, the difference between our intelligent biblical designer and naturalistic's random chance is immense. 
There is no comparison. This hammer was found encased in rock. Well, since Darwin is saying we evolved from a wet rock, right? A big bang formed a big rock, it rained on the rock, and well, here we are. What if I told you this hammer was evolving from the rock? <laughs> you would think I was crazy, right? Well, let me ask you a question. Why would you think that? I mean, it's just a, a clump of iron and a stick put in it. Why would you not believe me if I told you it was evolving from the rock? Well, because even a hammer shows too much intelligent design to have come about on its own. Well, listen, you are hundreds of trillions of times more complex than a hammer. Don't let somebody in convince you you evolved on your own from a wet stone. In Genesis 1, we have trees made on day 3, birds on day 5, and animals on the sixth day before man was created. Then in Genesis 2, we have birds, trees, and animals made on day 6 after man was created. I've had many scoffers tell me this is an error in the Bible or that these are two different creations. Well, I've seen several good uh, responses to this, but let, let me give you my mind, which I think is fairly simple and straightforward. Genesis 1 is describing the overall creation week, just the big events of each day, sort of a macro overall look. In Genesis 2, we get into more of a micro look into events on day 6 around the time man was created. In Genesis 2 verses 8 and 19, we're told God planted a garden eastern in Eden where he put man whom he had formed, and he brought them the creation, the animals, to see what he would call them and so that Adam could pick out a helpmate. I think God created things, this is my own interpretation, right there in front of Adam. Boom, what is this? That's a bird. Boom, what is this? It's an alligator. So that Adam could see that God was indeed the creator. I also think this is why Satan later approached Eve because she had not actually seen God create and he could convince her that she could be as God, she could be her own God. In the book of Genesis, we're told that God said, let the earth bring forth grass, herb, and the fruit tree after their kind. Did you know that bees are needed to pollinate flowers? Well, the surface of the bucket orchid is very slimy. So when a bee comes and he lands on that bucket orchid, he slips and he falls down into the bucket below. Well, in the bottom of the bucket is a pool of slimy liquid, so he lands splat into that pool, and he swims around trying to get out. Well, there's one tunnel that goes to the outside of the flower, and at the edge of the pool, there's a step so he can climb up on the step and crawl through the tunnel to escape. But as the poor little bee is climbing through the tunnel, the walls of the tunnel contract on him and capture him and hold that little bee there until the the uh, flower glues two pollen sacs to his back. Well, once time is given for the glue to dry, the flower releases the bee. Now, if he flies on to another bucket orchid, he goes through the whole process once again. He lands on the pedal, slips, falls into the pool at the bottom of the bucket, crawls over or swims over and climbs up the step and through the tunnel toward the outside. But this time, the tunnel walls contract and capture him once again. He's probably thinking, deja vu, it seems like I was just here. But this time, while the flower holds the bee, two hooks remove the pollen sacs, completing the pollination process. Talk about awesome proof of your intelligent biblical designer. There's no way this could have evolved over long ages of time. In Genesis 1, we're told God said, let the earth bring forth cattle and beast after their kind. The giraffe's head stands about 18 feet above the ground, and that's about 10 feet above its heart. He was designed with a two-foot-long heart that produces tremendous blood pressure to force the blood up through that long neck and to provide oxygenating blood to his brain. Well, wait a minute. The first time the giraffe bends down to get a drink, what kept that blood pressure from blowing his head off? Well. He was designed with a very unique system of arteries and blood vessels and a pressure sensing system that cut the blood off to his head so he doesn't injure himself. Well, what keeps him from passing out, especially when he stands up? 
Well, he was also designed with an organ just before his brain. It's a sponge-like organ that absorbs oxygenating blood and supplies the blood to his brain while he's bent down to get a drink and supplies it until the blood returns in its normal flow. The Bible says that, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Did you know that your brain weighs only about three pounds? And yet it is the most awesome computer system in the history of the world. It computes and sends billions of pieces of data to trillions of nerves via your central nervous system. Your ear is designed with three tiny bones that are fully formed when you are born. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to make out sounds until you were an adult. Your eye has over one and a quarter million nerve connections in a one square inch area. It can perform over a hundred thousand functions, including healing itself. It's been estimated it would take a Cray supercomputer running 24 hours a day, seven days a week, over a hundred years to simulate what can take place in your, through your eye many times in a couple of seconds. Talk about proof of your intelligent biblical designer. Did you know there are about five different eyes known to mankind that have been discovered? So the evolution of the eye from a wet rock wouldn't even be a one-time event. It would have had to have happened at least five times independent of the others. And there's no way it could mathematically take place once, much less five different times. If you've ever been to Mount Rushmore and you're looking up at those uh, large stone carvings, if I were to walk up next to you while you're looking at those and say, you know, those evolved over millions of years of rain and wind erosion, what would you think of me? You'd think this guy's a nut, right? Well, why would you think that? I mean, all it is is carved stone. Well, you would think that because even carved stone of this magnitude demands that there be a designer behind it. Well, you are trillions and trillions of times more complex than carved rock. Don't let anyone convince you you evolved on your own. The Bible says God formed the earth to be inhabited. In Job, we're told he binds up the waters in his thick clouds. Isaiah tells us the rain comes down and waters the earth that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. And Ecclesiastes tells us the rivers run into the sea from whence the rivers come, they return again. Well, this, these verses perfectly describe Earth's hydrologic cycle. The waters in the ocean evaporate and bind up in thick clouds. They move across the continents, rise and condense in rain or snow down, watering the earth, providing seed for the sower and bread for the eater. The excess waters bind up in rivers and streams and return to the oceans from whence they come, just like we've always been told through the word of God. In the book of Job, God tells Job that light is parted by the east wind. Well, science didn't discover that light causes the wind until the 1800s, 2,000 to 3,000 years after the book of Job told us it was so. Did you know there are 83 verses in the Bible concerning cleanliness to prevent the spread of germs? But these are written over 3,000 years before science discovered germs. In Psalm 104, we're told that bread strengthens man's heart. Bread strengthens our heart? Well, it used to when it was baked fresh every day. However, bread companies would go out of business because the bread would spoil after a day and a half on the shelves. So they did some research and they found out they removed about 15 vitamins and minerals and also omega-3 fatty acids, they could give us white bread that will stay on store shelves for a couple of weeks, allowing them to remain in business. However, here's something you should keep in mind the next time you go to the store. The whiter the bread, the quicker you're dead. Because it's the things that they remove that strengthen our heart and our circulatory system. In Genesis, we're told the sixth day the heavens and the earth were finished. God created, he finished his creation, and he claimed his creation was finished. The first law of thermodynamics is the law of conservation of mass and energy. That matter and or energy cannot be created or destroyed. I think when God said the creation was finished, what he meant was that the creation 
was finished. In Exodus 20, verse 11, we're told, For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth the seas, and all that in them is. Now, do you think that's really important to God? This is in the middle of the Ten Commandments, etched into stone by God's very own finger. I think he knew this would be the major point of Satan's attack on his word in the last days. Now, according to a biblical timeline, the creation was six or so thousand years ago. I don't think we can be exact. The global flood took place 44 to 4,500 years ago. And we're told the flood came and destroyed them all. Now back to that uh, great prophecy in 2 Peter 3, verses 3 through 6. They'll come in the last days scoffers who will be willingly ignorant that by the word of God, the world that was being overflowed with water perished. The Bible foretells in the last days, scoffers will deny the global flood. Well, why in the world would you deny the global flood? Because every old earth belief is based on a belief the earth's crust, those so sedimentary layers laid down by water, form slowly over long ages of time, putting death before Adam. And a global flood would explain how those sedimentary layers laid down by water form quickly, wiping out every old earth belief. And I cover this thoroughly, including the isotope dating methods, the radiometric dating, carbon dating, and I show you how they work so you understand how they really do not work Old Earth beliefs are based on a belief the layers form slowly in our Old Earth global flood teaching. In 1 Peter 3, we're told that while the ark was preparing, wherein eight souls were saved. There are eight people on the ark. Noah, his wife, his three sons, and three daughter-in-laws. So eight people, four couples on the ark, somewhere around 4,400 years ago. Well. Human population studies say if you started with four couples 4,400 years ago, and if they averaged 2.2 children per couple, we would have about 7 billion people on Earth today. Census studies say there are about 7 billion people on Earth today. You know, this is a problem for old Earth believers because if you went back 100,000 years, nothing in evolutionary times, and you started with just one couple 100,000 years ago, and if they averaged 2.2 children per couple, you would have about 150 people per square inch over the entire globe. Once again, uh, the studies support the Word of God. Dendrochronology, or tree ring dating, is certainly not an exact science. Uh, trees can actually make uh, more than one tree ring in a year. However, scientific studies uh, based on tree ring dating indicate the oldest living organism is a bristlecone pine that is estimated to be 4,300 years old, fitting the biblical timeline with the flood quite well. The oldest known living uh, reef is the Great Barrier Reef off the coast of Australia. A 20-year study indicates it's about 4,200 years old, again fitting with the biblical accounts. There are about 1,200 minerals in and on Earth today. Many can be measured in the oceans. Uh, they remain in the ocean. They're washed in by uh, rivers, uh, streams, rain runoff, leaching from land masses, etc. And you can actually, scientists can actually measure the amount of influx today, at today's rate. Well, by the amount that they're increasing, every single one that can be measured shows an ocean too young for evolutionary requirements. For instance, I've seen some studies that say salt, for an example, in which now the oceans are 3.6% salt. At the rate of influx today, those oceans could be as young as 50,000 years. Now, that's a problem for old Earth beliefs, which need billions of years, but is that a problem for a young Earth that's maybe a few thousand years old? Well, no, because God could have created it with salt in it from the start, and also a lot of that was washed in during the flood. All the 1,200 mineral, minerals that can be measured are showing an ocean much too young for evolutionary needs. The Bible tells us the foundation of the earth and the heaven shall perish. They shall wax old like a garment. Well, the second law of thermodynamics is the law of entropy, that things will perish. They will wax old. They lose information and order and become less and less organized over time.
For instance, the Earth's magnetic field has been scientifically measured to have weakened by 6% over the past 150 years. Well, that's not a problem for the biblical creation, but for old Earth beliefs, that's a big problem because at the rate it's dissipating, just going back 12,000 years, it would have had the strength of a magnetic star. And there's no way life could have existed on our planet a few thousand years ago. In 2 Corinthians, we're warned, I fear lest that by any means the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind shall be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. It is so easy to believe in Jesus. You read his word and you put your faith in the word of God. But Satan throws a lot of stumbling blocks out there that makes it not quite so easy, doesn't he? Let's discuss Satan's standard operating procedure. It's found the first time he shows up in Scripture in Genesis 3, verse 1, where in the Garden of Eden he asks Eve, Hath God said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Well, Eve tells him they're not supposed to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, to which Satan, once he's put doubt in Eve's mind by asking her a question, now denies God's word. If you eat of that tree, you surely shall not die. So first, plant doubt by asking a question, then deny God's word, and then deify that person. He tells Eve, if you eat of the tree, your eyes will be opened, and you shall be like God yourself. Doubt, deny, and deify. It's Satan's standard operating procedure. For instance, today, Satan plants doubt in people's mind by asking a question. Hath God said he created in six real days? And now deny God's word. No, no, man evolved over millions of years of time, putting death, by the way, before Adam. And then deify that individual. You are the most evolved. You are your own God. Doubt, deny, and deify. It's Satan's standard operating procedure. In Romans 1, 22, we're told that professing themselves to be wise, some people are going to be fooled. And they're going to change the glory of the uncorruptible God, which I think today is his creation, into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Well, it sounds to me like they're going to change creation into the fairy tale of Darwinian evolution that lets you think you're the most evolved, you're your own God. Now, these verses are talking about idolatry. And the highest form of idolatry is to think you are the most evolved. Darwin's book was published in 1859, The Origin of the Species by Means of Natural Selection, or The Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. I don't think they use the second part of that uh, uh, title today in colleges, do they? But if you think you're the most of all, that means you can be your own god, and in a tooth and claw survival of the fittest mode, do whatever you want to what you consider the less evolved of your species. And I cover Darwinism and destroy Darwinism, including showing you how to destroy it in four seconds flat in our 50 Facts versus Darwinism in the textbooks teaching. One kind lacks the genetic information to produce another kind, making Darwinism scientifically impossible. There's a principle called gene depletion, and basically what it states is that mutations and adaptations result from the sorting or loss of the starting gene pool. So changes, micro changes within the same kind are caused by the sorting or loss of information, so gene pools get weaker and weaker. Farmers can breed corn for all sorts of end pur purposes, from sweet corn, eating corn, popcorn, cattle feed, etc. But the changes cause the corn to become weaker and weaker genetically. They breed out the information they don't want through gene depletion. Never will corn produce a rat, a rose, or a racehorse. That would be a Darwinian style change. It never has even a single example of Darwinian change been found that will hold up to scientific scrutiny. Now natural selection is a term that we apply to when animals, creatures, plants, or animals, I should say, get into an environment in which they don't have the genetic information to exist. God made his gene pools with a wide range of variations so creatures could adapt to climates and conditions. But once a, a plant or animal gets into an environment where it does not have the genetic information to survive, 
it simply dies. Now we call that natural selection, but there actually is no selector involved. Yet this textbook tells kids how natural selection causes evolution. If anything, it would prevent evolution. It has nothing to do with the religious fairy tale of Darwinian evolutionism. And while kids today are taught neo-Darwinism, that mutations plus natural selection lead to neo-Darwinian evolution, here's how you destroy Darwinism in four seconds flat. Gene depletion plus natural selection makes Darwinism a scientific impossibility. Stop your watch. And I cover this in much more detail in our 50 Facts in Darwinism in the textbook and my book, It's About Time, if you want to learn more about this. In Genesis 7, we're told that every beast will bring forth after his kind. Creeping things and fowls will bring forth after their kind. And after millions of scientific experiments, what is found is kinds only bring forth after their own kind. I think you'll agree that these are all cattle. There's black, brown, white cattle, spotted cattle, etc. But they're not different kinds, are they? They're still all cattle. The Bible says that God hath made of one blood all nations of men. Now, we have different colored skin, but we're not different kinds. We're still humans. Now, you see, people bring forth after their kind through the sorting or loss of Adam and Eve's original genetic information, which was then bottlenecked in the flood through Noah and his family. They don't bring forth by the evolution of new and better species. This is why we can do blood transfusions from people around the globe and kidney transplants from people around the globe. We didn't evolve to different levels. Uh, the Bible says, have we not all one father? Hath not God created us all? That brings us to the Y chromosome, Adam. Males have the XY chromosome. The Y is passed down from father to son. Well, a study in 1995 showed that we've all descended from one man known as the Y chromosome, Adam. In Genesis 3, we're told that Eve was the mother of all living. Well, a recent study shows that females have mitochondrial DNA. And studies show that mankind can be traced back to one woman known as mitochondrial Eve or African Eve. Well, Darwinists tried to assign an age of 500,000 years to Eve, but this from Science News. DNA mutation rate studies indicate Eve may only be about <clears throat> 6,000 years old, fitting the biblical accounts to a T. Oh Lord, the earth is full of thy riches, but I wouldn't have seen them if I didn't first believe them. I think that scientific knowledge of God is increasing rapidly. Recent discoveries in microbiology, biology, biochemistry, math, physics, etc. favor biblical creation. In fact, I think science should be defined as knowledge derived from the study of God's creation. That's real science. The Bible says that he that wins souls is wise. And that's the calling of this ministry, to teach about creation, evolution, and age of the earth issues, to expose false anti-biblical teachings in order to provide a reason for the hope that's in the heart of every true believer and every true seeker. I do this through our various messages, such as if the foundations be destroyed, Noah's Ark and dinosaurs, we cover America's great Christian heritage. We cover so much more. We cover these in our 13-part DVDs, uh, which I don't copyright, by the way. You're free to make all the copies you want and give those to others and ask them to make copies and give away as well. We need to get this information out to people. I cover this in our kids' coloring books, America's Christian Heritage, also called Endowed by Their Creator and our Noah's Ark and Dinosaur coloring book in which I cover the biblical foundations of creation, corruption, separation, and our need for redemption. And in our book, It's About Time, which covers uh, both Age of the Earth and Darwinian issues and much more. You can visit our website at creationministries.org and learn more about what we do. You can see uh, tons of our videos on our website. You can watch those. But share this with others, and let's get some information out there. Because Jesus said, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore that the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers. Let me end with a word of prayer.
Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day and for every dear soul that's here this morning. I hope and I pray the information that we've shared will be uh, fun, but also eye-opening and cause us to realize we can put our trust in your word, your word who became flesh and dwelt among us, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in his great name that I do pray, amen.